turn off their video. I'm going to uh, like uh, request everyone to turn off their video themselves. And I'm going to uh, request everyone to mute themselves except Anthony, myself. Masban is going to be joining in probably in a few minutes. He's uh, slightly under the weather, so he's joining in probably a few minutes late. Uh, so, yeah, welcome to session seven of uh, the masterclass in audio series. Uh, uh, Sandeep, can I request you to just uh, turn off your video for the time being? Yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll get you on once. Uh, once yeah. Yeah, so I request everyone uh, to turn off their uh, video and mute their audio. Uh, I have uh, I have outlined the uh, the protocols and the housekeeping rules in the chat window. So if anyone wants to access that, please go to the chat window in your uh, in your uh, Zoom on the top. Uh, I'm going to repeat the, uh, the, the these points once again for the sake of repetition for everyone, so that uh, everyone is on the same page. I request everyone to turn off their video and mute their audio, and if anyone. If anyone is uh, turning on their audio and their video at any point of time, please ensure that their mobile phones are on uh, silent mode. Um, uh, please, uh, please post your questions on the chat window. Uh, we will uh, review them at uh, at the end. One second, please. please. Uh, yeah, uh, Masban and I will review these questions at the end and uh, we will uh, post them to Anthony as the session progresses. Uh, a request also to keep the questions relevant to the topic. It's a very wide topic, so, but at the same time, we, we understand, I, I believe that everyone understands the topic, at least at, at a gross level. So request everyone to keep the topic, the questions uh, relevant to the topic. Uh, I will be introducing Sandeep also later as a panelist. Sandeep is a, a dear friend of mine and also a very uh, senior member of our audio industry. Uh, just one moment. I am getting some requests on WhatsApp uh, regarding the session. The link is not opening. Uh, just give me one moment, everyone, please. I'll just uh, address these issues and come back. One moment. Have you done the introductions, uh, Karthik? Uh, yes. Have you introduced our um, guest today? Not, not, not yet. I've just actually, uh, I've read the housekeeping rules. Hi, Masban. Uh, Masban, uh, I'm getting some uh, messages regarding the uh, inavailability of people to join in. So just one moment. Uh, you can do maybe Anthony's introduction if you don't mind, uh, Masban. Okay. While sure, it's not required, sure. actually, because uh, he's a very well-known entity. But at yeah, time, actually, yeah, very well-known <laughs> person. <laughs> And a uh, uh, very senior member of our industry. In fact, one of the pioneering, pioneering leaders in our industry as far as surround sound goes. Uh, many Absolutely. of you might not know, he was part of uh, George Lucas's team and was responsible for designing the 6.1 um, Dolby Digital ES, that's the extended surround uh, uh, protocols for the Phantom Menace. And... Uh, so that only alone gets him in the gallery of the greats. <laughs> He's also worked at Dolby Labs and at, uh, of course, uh, THX, uh, which is uh, George Lucas's company. And uh, he has recently started his own uh, company, Grimani Systems, which uh, designs um, high-end amplified uh, uh, Also got a company that does acoustic treatments. Uh, which designs acoustic treatments and all, which you can use uh, for your home theaters and your applications in designing listening spaces. Anthony um, will uh, let us in on uh, those products a little later on. He'll try to plug that in. If any distributors out here are keen on bringing his brand to India, please uh, do contact him later on. And they're fantastic products. And I'm sure we all will do uh, well with using them in our products. Uh, Anthony, if you're around, uh, um, another thing, Anthony um, speaks four languages. He was born in uh, Asia. So that's something we have common with him, <laughs> Anthony. And uh, he grew up in Europe before now making America his uh, permanent home. Uh, so Anthony, uh, a big hi to you from all of us in India. And we are poised with bated breath to hear you speak. And thanks again, Karthik, for a wonderful organizing this wonderful masterclass which I'm sure is going to really enlighten us on, on a subject that many of us think we know a little bit about, but, uh, you know, 
uh, we'll we'll get a lot of concepts clear today. I'm sure. Over to you, Anthony. Thanks, Madhavan. Uh, I'm I'm just going to make a small uh, introductory comment. So, uh, Anthony, before we start off, uh, thanks, Madhavan, once again for the introduction of Anthony, and sure. it requires no introduction. At all. Uh, I'll just maybe uh, so we yeah, have just at the outset discussed uh, Anthony and Anthony and I were discussing about uh, the topic in general, and I thought maybe we'll start off by just putting a general framework. So the idea is that we often have this perception that. Uh, many people in the industry have this perception that uh, the, uh, the electronics or the equipment matters the most and uh, it's immaterial of the uh, the room that the, the equipment is going to be used in that uh, they, they all if i have if i per, for example if i purchase a very costly and a very high end loudspeaker and i put that in uh, uh, any room that's going to sound great uh, is that so is that accurate is that an accurate statement is that a factually correct statement? Something that uh, a lot of people are not really aware of. Most of the people in our industry that I know don't even factor in, into consideration the room in their overall design. So this is something that I probably thought Anthony could throw some light on at the outset to sort of kickstart the discussion because we are broadly on the topic of uh, room design for uh, home theater, home cinema, as well as uh, two-channel uh, music. So Anthony, over to you. Well, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. It's great to be uh, on on this uh, my first time actually on this on this. I don't know what to call this a podcast. People still call it a podcast. Oh. Nobody's watching this on their iPod, I'm sure. Um, and uh, we've. Uh, I, I know this is going to be fun, and I know it's going to be hard for us to contain our energy to just uh, uh, 45 minutes today. I really had a little pre-session a few weeks ago with Kartik and and uh, Musman and and we uh, we were just going to do a little test and we we spoke for an hour before we even knew it was like blah 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 this is fun this is great this uh, what that is was fun that, that was today. that was real fun <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, interesting so um so the 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 thing you bring up is interesting um what's what's more important is you know the is the gear that important well if you sell expensive gear the gear is really important and our industry was formed essentially historically by manufacturers that made electronics and loudspeakers and cables and things like that. So that that focus is there and and uh, on on the gear, the gear, the gear, the gear. And the gear is important. You got to have decent gear. Um, but yeah. the environment in which you are electroacoustically is also extremely important. And you really need to consider the entire thing. What's interesting is. When people talk about home theaters uh, or movie theaters, they're talking about a room. A theater, a theater is not a speaker. A theater is an overall space in which there's seating and there's lighting and there's an environment and there's a vibe and there's a screen and there's a projector if you're using a projector. So it really is a, it's an ensemble. And you wanna consider, when it comes to the sound, you wanna consider the, the room conditions a lot. So I have an interesting uh, little PowerPoint graph that I like to show uh, to really nail that home, how important that is. So uh, I'm assuming that I can maybe share screen. Okay, uh, so Kartik, if you can uh, enable screen sharing, um, I, will, I will show this little diagram that explains what I mean by that. All right. Let me try again. There it is. Give me a quick second to get this slideshow started. We're going to put it on screen two. And we're going to start from the beginning. Uh, okay. There we go. So originally when we, uh, when we started the conversation about this, we can confirm that you can see what it says here. Acoustics for two-channel audio and home cinema. You see that? No, this, this, your screen's not shared yet. Okay, because I didn't hit the share button. Okay, 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 my bad. Here we go. Let's start that again. We can get this working. We can eventually. Yeah, yeah, we, we can hear that. We can, hear, we can see it now. Seeing that. All right, and you can see... Yeah, acoustics for two-channel audio and home cinema. Great, excellent. Um, so let me, uh, let me actually fast forward a little bit. Um, you know... I guess I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna 
pause. So let's 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 do the important things here. So let, let's go through this a little bit. Um, what what makes good sound in the end is of course a good amplifier and of course a good speaker and of course a good source um, and preferably well recorded material. This is clearly a case of garbage in garbage out. If it if you're starting something that was recorded over a really bad microphone system in a really noisy place, very far away with street noise and an echo, it's not going to sound good. And so hopefully the people that are here have all heard the difference between a good recording and not so good recording. Um, but um, if you if you start with a good source and a and a good source material and you have good electronics and all of that, you're off to a good start. But the room is important, and the things that matter in the room is the background noise, the actual available dynamic range of the room, and then what happens in the acoustics of the room. So let's let's start with that part. There was a little bit of an introduction about me. I have a degree in electrical engineering, and this is sort of like a quick um, quick recap of what I've been doing. Um, and let's go through all of this. Uh, by the way, the technology was called Surround EX, not ES, X for extended. Um, there you go. Um, and I do a whole bunch of other things for fun. I don't only do AV. I, I have one of, one of my fun little toys is a 1937 Morris 8, which is this funky little old car. And a few months ago, I came out of a store uh, my car was parked outside and there's this old Indian couple staring, just holding each other and looking at my car. I'm like, oh, hi, how's it going? And they're like, this is your car? It's like, yeah, we had this car when we got married in, in Calcutta, I think they were from. Like, you did? Get in, let's go for a drive. And they, they were enchanted. They were enchanted. Um, no, fifty thousand. No, change in life. Fifty. Kindly mute your mic. Okay. Yeah, I uh, muted him from here. All right. Um, so, so just once again, uh, Anthony uh, Premal, uh, Premal, bhai, can you please mute your uh, microphone and turn off your video, please? Uh, I think you have turned it on. Just uh, any, uh, just a quick introduction, please. Uh, uh, housekeeping rule, please turn off your microphone, mute your audio and stop your, uh, as in, uh, turn off your video, please. I request only Anthony, Masban and myself to have the video and audio on, please. Yeah, over to you, Anthony. Back to you. All right. Um, anyway, so about Thank the you. acoustics of this. Um, wh one of the things that makes really expensive electronic equipment uh, expensive um, is its dynamic range, it's, is its noise floor is its peak levels. It is expensive to make an amplifier that has a lot of output voltage and current and also has very low background noise. It's equally expensive to do that in a surround processor or pre amplifier. So ideally the electronics have at least 100 decibels of dynamic range. If you put them in a room that is noisy, like most rooms, if you put them in a room that has a background noise of 30 decibels, you've just lost 30% of your sound quality. Because in the top end, you don't want to play much above 100 dB, maybe 105 before it just gets to be too much for your hearing. And so the bottom 30 dB are lost. You've, you've just wasted your money, or if you're a professional in this business, your client's money in selling him something that's exceptional. But the, but the fine detail, that stuff that is the audio equivalent of very fine cuisine where, where you're, you're tasting something and the sauce is just perfectly made, um, you've lost it. So background noise is the thing you got to worry about. Um, so uh, I, I like to think of background noise as two different things. One is constant background noise. It ends up masking all the fine detail. And then there's transient background noise, which would be like a refrigerator turning on, ventilation turning on or something else. And it's distracting you either from the music you're listening or the movie you're watching. So what do we need? We need at least 100 dB of dynamic range which is huge. Um, so the target for that would be what's called NC20, which is a measurement of a noise criteria. And it looks like this. It's not just 20 decibels across the, the range of hearing because we are more sensitive at high frequency than we are at low frequency. But this, this curve right here, 
uh, which is a brownish orange, and I will call it a brown, uh, represents the sound level at different frequencies of what you would want if you're really obsessive, really obsessive about your sound quality. Or if you're working in a recording studio and you want really, really quiet background noise so you can hear everything or record everything. Um, that's remarkably low. Um, if you walk into a room that's NC20, you'll notice it's very quiet. Most rooms, most environments are NC30, NC40. Again, noise criteria. If you actually look carefully, you'll see at the NC30 line, you'll see the 30 line intersects that at around one to two kilohertz. Uh, that's sort of the, uh, the unity position of this. So the NC40 line over here, you'll see it the 40 decibel line intersects that right around one to two kilohertz. Yeah, I, I hope you can see that, that that's sort of the normalizing point. Uh, but you're more sensitive at, at, at high frequency and less sensitive at low frequency, so you can get away with more low frequency noise. Bottom line is if you're about to spend a bunch of money on a really expensive amplifier, really expensive speakers, first thing you need to think about is a room that's very quiet. Otherwise you're wasting your time. And what, what makes noise in a room um, is ventilation. So air conditioners, uh, heaters, even things just moving air in the room produce noise. And so you, you wanna make sure that the ducts are large enough. I'm sorry, this is in feet per minute. I also have this in, in uh, the measurements in Europe in meters per second. But um, you basically wanna think that the, the ventilation ducts are bigger than you used to seeing and that you hear no noise. You basically, you, all, you almost have to go right up to the duct to hear any wind in there. Um, so how do you get there? There's a whole bunch of things that good acousticians know how to do, which is to do oversized ducts, run, run them a long distance between the, the source fan and the room. Uh, you can use silencers. There's a whole bunch of different ways. This, I don't, I don't want to get into a whole course about this, but the, the thing is to be sensitive to the fact that the room needs to be quiet. Um, also in a lot of places I go when I'm, when I'm actually, uh, you, you can measure all these things with spectrum analyzers and microphones. And when you look, you'll see some noise in, in the mid range and you'll usually see something around 50 Hertz or hundred Hertz or 60 Hertz or 120, depending on what country you're in. And that's usually the rumble of the motor going because it's mounted directly onto the wall or to the ceiling uh, of the building structure. And you want to isolate that on either springs or on rubber isolators. Um, so this gets, by the way, I could speak about this for three hours and I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I just wanna make you aware that yes, you want good equipment, but you're only gonna use that, you're only gonna get the value of that equipment if you start off with a room that's quiet. So how do you measure a quiet room? Um, you, can, you can get a test microphone. You know, th this is actually a relatively cost-effective microphone you can buy. Uh, from either Audix uh, or the um, Behringer now sells it. And you gotta have a, a decent mic preamplifier and all these other things. Or you can use this instrument that's built into most people's heads called an ear. How do you use that? Well, this is what I do. I go into a room and I plug my ears for like a few seconds or bring earplugs and stick the earplugs in there and just wait. until my hearing has kind of come down to the internal noise in my body, which is, in my case is very noisy. Um, so you do this and then you gently pull your fingers out and you go, and you start to notice all the noise around you. And so all of you guys who are sitting there right, right now, just do this, just, just like five seconds, just plug your ears like this. And listen, do you, notice, do you notice what's around you? So just from doing that, I can notice the tiny little fan that's in my computer. Um, and I notice the, the lights, there, there's a ballast up there. I can notice that I, you know, that you wouldn't hear. Um, all of that uh, covers unconsciously the, the, the low level sounds that are important in your sound quality. Um, and later when we open this for questions, I, I would love to hear what, what you guys are noticing. All right, so that's the first thing. Next thing is to worry about sound reflections. So um, ideally, you know, I, I would love to imagine a, um, 
a point in our life as as mu musical lovers or film lovers that the source material will plug directly into our brain via a wireless interface and without actually having to have devices that transduce sound through amplifiers that pushes it in air and like goes into our ears and we, we actually get all that completely. That's science fiction. I don't imagine that happening for a very long time. So we're still stuck with these things called loudspeakers, right? That are producing or reproducing the sound that was recorded in the original environment, whether it's a movie theater or a, a movie theater mix or a, a music studio mix. And then it has to go into the room and hopefully between all of those, like I said, you have decent equipment and good source material, decent cables and all of that. And then you have this pristine sound. If you say you've gotten a really good loudspeaker and maybe we'll talk a little later, what is a good loudspeaker? And you're gonna, you're gonna put it in the room and now what? Well, there's going to be a direct sound from the speaker to you. One small vector of sound as the wave propagates out of the speaker, one small part of those waves are going to hit you. And if it's a good speaker, that will be linear. It'll have low distortion. It'll be the same at all frequencies. It'll be good. Um, and then there's the sound that goes, that doesn't hit you. The sound that's going off in the, the right direction, left for me, right? Uh, let's say that's I, let's say I'm a loudspeaker and I'm hitting your I'm passing your right side. I'm not actually hitting your head, but I'm going past and I'm bouncing around the room a number of times and eventually finding your ear. Okay, that's a reflection, and it's never an arrow. By the way, it's always represented as arrows. It's actually waves, propagation of pressure of positive and negative pressure that propagate into each other. But you can sort of follow the path of that wave. And in this case, it took one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five bounces before it got back to you. It got delayed quite a bit. Then there's another reflection that bounces this way. And then there's another reflection. These are pretty much in 10 degree increments. Another one, another one, another one, another one. <coughs> and where, where did those, all those red arrows come from? Well, typical modern loudspeakers have a dispersion that's pretty wide. So they send, a, a well-designed speaker sends about the same sound directly to you as it does 20, 30, up to 40 degrees off axis. It's the same sound energy. And that energy bounces around the room and comes back to you. Um, so you can see there's a fair number of red arrows here. And that's only one half of the room. If we look at the left side, there's a lot more arrows. And I'm only showing this up to five bounces. In reality, there's six, seven, eight bounces. Uh, every bounce reduces the level a little bit. Every travel reduces the level a little bit because it's going through air, which is an elastic medium. It has some friction, so it loses energy and dissipates. Um, but here's where it gets interesting. The sum total of all these little red arrows when you're sitting three meters away, let's say you're in a room that's five meters long and you're sitting three meters away. Um, there actually is about two times, between two and three times more energy in all of these red arrows than there is in the original blue arrow. Each one of the arrows is smaller, but the sum total of it is larger. So when you're listening to a speaker, whether it's a center speaker or a right speaker or a left speaker, side left, doesn't really matter. When you're sitting, um, Let's, let's just say three meters away, in a room with no treatments, there's about two to three times more energy coming from all of the sound reflections than there is the direct sound from the speaker to you. The reflected sound dominates. And that is why you wanna have a conversation when you're talking about choosing speakers, when you're talking about designing a system, you wanna have a conversation about this. You wanna figure out, well, what do I do with this? Uh, by the way, if you get closer to the speaker, as you get closer and closer and closer, the amount of red energy doesn't really change. It's sort of steady state in the room. Whether, whether you're here, it's a different bounce point, but when you're here, it's about the same net reflected energy, but the direct sound gets louder and louder because you're getting closer to the speaker. Um, and there's a point in acoustics that's sometimes known as the critical distance. It does not quite accurate in small rooms, but there's a point in most rooms where the direct sound and the reflected sound energy is the same. And that's somewhere between one and a half and two meters from the speaker. 
at that point, at one and a half to two meters from the speaker, you have the same energy going directly from the speaker to you as the reflected energy. Not dominated yet, just the same. So anywhere past that, you're dominated by reflected energy. For that reason, you want to consider how the speaker is interacting in the room. That's really, really pretty essential. Um, so um, ultimately, I'm going to stop this share now. I got to figure out where that has gone hiding. There it is. Stop share. Um, so for for that reason, for those two reasons, the one of of uh, background noise and the one of um, sound reflections in the room, you have to consider that the room is a part of your system. So there's uh, from left to right, if you think in that direction, there's uh, actually I I start I start the the point at the source content, the song, the music you're playing, how well recorded it is, or the movie you're watching. Some movies have horrible soundtracks, and some have beautiful soundtracks. So it starts there. Then, what's the device you're using, and what formats is it using? Then what's what's your you know preamplifier surround processor? What's your amplifier? What are your speakers? What's your room? What's that final interface between the speakers and your head and how that all interferes? That's, that's the whole system, all of those points. Thanks, that, <clears throat> that, that was really good. Uh, thanks for that uh, wonderful first slide, as I say. We've got a lot to go through. <laughs> I've got a lot more. <laughs> Um, so, um, all, all this to say that, um, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to put up another slide here. Uh, I'm going to put up a slide of a classical hi-fi buff who bought expensive equipment and didn't know what I just said. I was, this is a room I was brought to last Tuesday to go work. I do this. I'm, I am lucky to be working uh, in my daily, in my, you know, you take a year of my life and I work everywhere in perfectly designed uh, uh, recording studio, mastering labs. And, in, and then the very next day I could be working in a general purpose space like what I'm going to share here. Give me a second. Um, so do you, uh, do you see this? I need to move the grid. Can you guys see this room? Yeah, we can see it. Uh, yeah, we can see yeah, it. yeah, we can. So this is this is what I call a mixed use room in a nice house up in the hills uh, at the top of uh, Berkeley and, and Oakland. Absolutely gorgeous view on the San Francisco Bay. Um, the client just finished a remodel, um, and they bought some nice British-made speakers. They had a giraffe here that I thought was really pretty, um, and they chose the gear. Uh, because they read internet resources, et cetera, et cetera. It fit their budget. These are decently made monitor audio speakers. Um, and then they put them in and they go, wow, it doesn't sound so good. Can you come and help? So what's the first thing I notice is there's no acoustical anything. There isn't even a carpet on the floor. Next thing I do is I clap my hands and it goes, and I go, wow, it sounds like one, about 1 1.2 seconds of reverb time to me. Next thing I do is I put up the microphones and I start to measure. I go past the giraffe and I uh, set up an array of microphones, measure the room. And uh, let's see if I can bring this up. This is a measurement of the reverb time of that room. Wow. Um, and this is uh, me me looked looked at it a few different ways. Um, there, this is using Room EQ Wizard, which is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, mm. And I guess I can say that I've done this enough that I can now kind of tell what the reverb time is without having to put up a microphone, which means I should really <laughs> spend more time with my uh, kids, my bicycle, and other things than doing this. But um, there's the reverb time of this room. So what, what does this mean? Speakers putting sound out into the room and it, it is held one, it takes 1.2 seconds before everything that's put out of that speaker is done bouncing around uh, and disappears down into being gone. Uh, this is 
an extraction of what's called RT60. It's the time it takes to get down 60 decibels. But I think of it as a reflection decay time. So it is what it is. All right, so what do you do with that? Well, you just have to know that everything's gonna be accompanied with a sauce of lots of reverberation. But wait, there's more. Um, I, uh, if this was an open classroom, I would, I would actually ask, does anybody notice anything else that's a problem here? And can, can we do that, Kartik? Can, I, can we actually open to sure. anybody raising their sure. hand and go, oh, I see something yeah. that is really problematic. Yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's an open question to everyone. Um, uh, anyone who's interested in taking this on, uh, this question on, please raise your hand on the, there's an option of raising your hand on the chat window. So I, I see two problems here. One is very long reverberation time, 1.2 seconds. It's just an infinity of time. It's like a mm -hmm. concert hall, even though this is a it's, a, it's a regular home, tall ceilings, but there's another issue going on too. So uh, Thomas, uh, Anthony, uh, Thomas uh, has mentioned that uh, there's an issue with the center of speaker placement. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah that's also very high. <laughs> That's also an issue. I think we're talking specifically with this graph, right? This graph. That's right. Does anybody notice? So, so could you just, I can't see what's on the x-axis and what's on the y-axis. Sure. So this is frequency from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz on, on the x-axis. This is reverberation versus time. So on the x-axis is time. Um, it's in the case, in the case of uh, uh, REW, this is a waterfall that shows in very, very high resolution how the sound is decaying down at different frequencies. But it's basically an extrapolation of that saying that, you know, at around uh, one kilohertz and around there, the, the reflection decay time is 1.2 seconds. That's how long it takes to go. So this is uh, 200 milliseconds, uh, four, six, eight, uh, 100 milliseconds, 1,000 milliseconds, which is a second, 1.2, 1.4, 1.6. So frequency here and uh, reflection decay time over here. Anybody so, want to take? So I, I see that. We have got plenty of uh, remarks on the chat window. So uh, okay, you want me, me to run, run through let that? Me see, let me see if I yeah. can okay. open that. Uh, chat right over here. You have to so understand, I'm, I'm looking at multi multiple screens at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Um, it starts with uh, Dr. Thomas Hafner. Uh, he has mentioned uh, center speaker placement as one of the issues. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. So somebody, uh, AV Sonus Technology, says the low frequency decay is lesser than the mids and highs. Uh, did anybody else mention that? Which software, which software helps do this exercise? Room EQ Wizard. As somebody else said, low frequency. Um, all right. Uh, bye, Roy. Roy is, is uh, checking out. So, uh, correct. Uh, who mentioned that is that this reflection decay time is not equal at all frequencies. So, here's a... Um, actually, this, these speakers have a, have a little problem, which I'll bring up later if we have to. But let's just say, here's a perfectly good speaker putting sound out in the room. In the mid-frequency, it stays for 1.2 seconds. Uh, between 500 hertz and let's say two kilohertz, three kilohertz. And below that, below that frequency, it dies out after half a second. And at high frequency, it dies out also. So, so the, spe the speaker is putting out sound into the room and the room is, is biasing it. It's actually putting a lot of mid frequency. So what this, speak what this system sounds like when I first put some music on there is it sounds like this. It sounds mid-rangey. It sounds like a bullhorn. It sounds like a bad old speaker. And it's a brand new speaker that the client spent a lot of money on. And where that comes from is that piece of the equipment called the room that the client, nobody had told them, nobody, you know, the people that sold them the gear never said, hey, where are you putting this? Nobody brought this to his attention. So what do we do with this? So I'm going to this up because this is real. Uh, I one and I request everyone to please, apart from Anthony, myself, and uh, Mazdan, please mute your audio. Please mute your audio. I'm having a lot of participants having their audio turned on, please. This is a housekeeping uh, uh, statement which I'm making once again. Please turn off your audio and turn off your video too, please. Thank you. Anthony, back to you. Yep. 
Um, so, uh, th thank you. Let's see. I'm going to go back to, uh, I see here, AVE Sonos technology. Uh, that, um, the, the low frequency decay, um, very, very uncommon bass behavior. Actually, not so much. I usually find this in very large open spaces. I, I see this reflection decay. What happens is the, the mid-frequency sounds, which are wavelengths that go from about 60 centimeters uh, down to two or three centimeters, they basically bounce around the walls. Um, let me go back to this picture. Um, they, they bounce freely around the walls and ceiling and floor of the space, um, un, un, unimpeded. You know, there's very little to stop them. Um, and then the high frequencies, the really short ones, bend and, and get, get diffused and get diffracted at every bounce. They get attenuated. Also, with the travel of time, they get lost. Um, and the low frequency waves, the longer ones that are three, four, five meters long, propagate through the whole property, through the whole house. And so they they don't stay in the room; they just dissipate. And uh, I see... can I ask one thing? Yep. Um, the the wall material is this in America? I think it's different than in Europe. So the the wall material here, um, you're almost right. Although I'm seeing this construction a lot more in Europe, the wall material is gypsum board on studs, which is going to absorb low low frequencies below forty hertz. That becomes pretty absorptive. Uh, yeah, because in Austria and Germany, uh, walls are massive and you have always an, more like an opposite behavior. Yeah. Yep. Um, but but if you have massive walls in Austria and you have big open spaces just like this, then it's, I, I've, then worked, of course. I've worked yeah. in many countries where concrete construction is a thing and where somebody has a listening room over there and it opens up into everything. It's the same. I yeah, can of course. Up and open spaces, yes. If we had a lot of time, I'd pull up a measurement I just did in Argentina of a beautifully architectured home with a very, very expensive loudspeakers and electronics, about $500,000 of, of audio gear only, same about the same curve as, as the bass dissipates away into the other com communicating spaces. So the differences in construction do, do affect this region below 60 hertz, absolutely. The difference between gypsum on studs on you know on wood or metal versus concrete but this just comes from the dissipation of the energy just disappearing bottom line though is you this is analytical right this is a chart measured by a microphone and then you play some music and it sounds like this it sounds shouty and nasty and upper mid rangey and it's like ah i can't listen to this diana crawl sounds like she's screaming at me so uh so what do we do with this? Well, the right thing is to apply some treatments. You know, you gotta you gotta put something on on the ceiling, these walls. You know, you gotta put a bit of carpeting on the floor. You gotta do something to reduce this reflection de decay time in the middle to bring it down and make it more like the rest. Um, and I'm hoping this client is going to accept to go there. And. If it sounds shouty, you can take an equalizer and you can turn down that shoutiness, which is very, very, very challenging because it will sound different for different types of sounds. And so that's a whole conversation that people get into in the upper levels of uh, audio engineering, which is what is the character of the transient sound? Things like um, that are short and percussive versus things that are long and legato, they are going to drive the room differently. And so you, as you equalize, you can't do it the same all the way across. It's a little challenging. Um, anyway, I'm, I am going to bring this back up uh, before I forget um, to point out that these reflections are a problem. We, we don't want to have all reflections. Um, but interestingly enough, even in these very reflective spaces, you can still sort of tell that the speaker's over there, which is really interesting. Uh, if the sound reflections dominate by a factor of two, how can I still hear that the sound is over there? And you, you can tell because your brain is always trying to figure out from all these sounds, where, where's the first arriving one? Sometimes known as the Haas effect, 
or the precedence effect, sometimes people call it. But our brain is very good at detecting when the first arrival was and go, that's where the sound went. But meanwhile, all this other sound energy is going into your, uh, into your ears and really confusing it. It takes brain power to, to cancel it out. So, um, anyway, so uh, let's, uh, oh yeah, this is where I wanted to go. Now, I have seen people that have read a little bit about acoustics or an architect or somebody says, okay, well, you know, we're going to make this a listening room. We're going to pad all the walls. And they put maybe a centimeter or two centimeters of felt or some other foam all the way around the room. That's bad. Uh, because it, what you're doing is you're absorbing all the sound reflections and you do want a little bit of reflection energy. You, you want some reflected energy in the room so that it feels comfortable. So it feels real. And so that the speakers and the walls integrate it well together. And so there's a place between all reflective, like in this room, 1.2 seconds, and the inverse, which would be putting padding everywhere, there's the right number. And I guess it's just like cooking, you know, if a little bit of sauce is good, if a little bit of salt is good, that doesn't mean you take the entire bag of salt and put it into your sauce. That's going to be terrible, right? So, um, you need to preserve the reflections and you need to do just the right amount. Anyway, let's, um, I suggest that we go to the, maybe the next question. I'll stop this share. Kartik, I know that you had a few other things you wanted to go into, but I. So see this Anthony, yeah. like we said, the room, the room is, is the beast that we got to tame, right? Before right. we even touch the DSP or the equalizer. So, um, so my point is now that we we touched upon the room a bit, uh, are there is a room designed to a specific speaker or is a room designed by itself? I mean, you know, I mean, do you try you get the room correct without understanding what's going into it, or do you actually know what's going to go into it and then with the specifics and the characteristics of the speaker, then you uh, typically treat this side, that side, or you know where reflections are going to be or where yeah. Typical predictive responses. Bhavin, Bhavin, can I request you to please turn on your uh, turn off your video, please? Bhavin? Only only Masban, uh, Anthony, and myself will keep our video on. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I would I would section section that as two levels. Uh, first level is there is a good average design for uh, a room in which most speakers are gonna work just fine. Um, and then there's an extra level of refinement, uh, depending on what you're, what, you're, uh, what you're listening to. Like if, if you're only listening to two channel, there's a few things you can refine. If you're listening to a mix of two channel and movie, there's some slight tweaks. If you're just only doing movies, there's some slight tweaks, but they're, they're this big compared to what you have to do for the room. And the first thing, regardless of what speaker you have, you need to deal with the noise floor. And that's ir uh, irrespective of the speaker. So um, somebody did actually ask, how do you get to NC10? Uh, yeah, Sandeep, uh, Sandeep uh, Javalkar, he's a, he's a very uh, well-known entity in uh, India. He's, in fact, he makes his own uh, loudspeakers and electronics as well. He's got his own company. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you might want to just unmute yourself and not uh, the video can be turned off. You can just unmute yourself and ask the question and anything else that you want to ask since Anthony raised this uh, particular point right now. Sandeep, uh, please go hi. ahead. Yeah. Hi, Anthony. I'm Sandeep here. So hi, Sandeep. I have a question uh, about, uh, like, you know, see, getting a noise criterion of 10. Because uh, when you see, like, like what you have mentioned very clearly that, you know, the more the higher you go, the more you are paying for the higher dynamic range. Yeah. and uh, higher the micro details and all stuff like that. So, you know, uh, I, I, I mean, uh, if you take a practical example, uh, this is one, usually a common example, which I usually tell to people that uh, if you if you listen to music in the late nights, you know, I'm, I'm talking about two late nights, everything is so calm and you see, fortunately, you see a lot of heaps and heaps of micro details that you can hear. You know, that, that's, that's, that's exactly what happens with, uh, when the noise flow comes down. So now my point is NC20 is hard to achieve, but I've seen people even achieving NC10 or even less. 
Yeah. Uh, I would like to know because uh, you know what what are the recommendations that you recommend if I have to reach NC5 or NC10? What is your take on it? Um, get a really good acoustician. Uh, it gets it gets complicated. There's a lot of things you got to think about. Um, but I I would say NC, NC20 is pretty hard to get to, and yeah. it it is going to require. Uh, the beginnings of a room within a room construction, so floated floor, floated walls, uh, and that's to, that's to get to NC20. NC10, uh, depending on where you are, is gonna is gonna take a floor that's a, a floated concrete floor, which you know there are people that make these special uh, sprung jacks that it's. Um, Kinetics Noise Control makes them. Mason Industries yep. goes makes them. If yep. you can remember those, note them down. Go look at their websites. But you basically pour a concrete floor, then you put these special jacks in there. You pour a second concrete floor with a special form with these things, and then when it's all dry, you raise the floor up on these springs, and now you have a floor that's isolated, that's massive, and then you build your walls on that isolated floor. And the walls are pretty massive and the ceiling is mounted on that floor and you have this box it's a bubble floating away from everything else and then you got to put air in and out of it because you still have to breathe you know you're not going to go in there with you know if you went in there with an oxygen tank and started to breathe you would mess up the whole process because that would make noise but you have to have a ventilation system that's very oversized and all all of that's done in really good recording studios or any places where you need it really quiet it gets really really complicated um, and pretty expensive, and then and and there it is. Um, the average background noise in a residence at night. This is sort of an international average. Is NC seventeen at night, middle of the night. You're you're at some distance from freeways and airports and trains and all of this stuff. The noise of a city is always there, uh, but once it all quietens down, it gets to seventeen. And you're right. That's when you start to hear stuff in your music. That you're like, where'd this come from? I never heard this before. Um, cause it was it just, was it was very, yeah. yeah. Um, right. so I, I would say, uh, it's complicated, probably beyond the scope of what we can address here. I, this is something I could go on also for three hours and pull up all kinds of designs and things, but, uh, there, there are very good acoustical firms worldwide that know how to do this, know how to do the vibration control. Uh, oh. they won't necessarily know how to, how to design a listening room. That's, it's mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, exactly. acoustic, ac the field of acoustics doesn't teach you necessarily how to produce beautiful sound staging out of a pair of speakers, out of, out of immersive audio, but they teach you how to do vibration control, noise control, and things like that. Um, and so just hire a good firm and they'll, they'll be able to, to help out with that. Just be prepared that it's going to be massive and expensive. Um, yeah, I think one one point, Anthony, that which I would, uh, which I'm actually currently working on is the, uh, the laminar flow. Of yeah. air, because the air turbulence itself creates considerable amount of noise. Because that's 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 a kind of thing which is really yeah. helping us streamline the airflow. Yeah. Like what you said, even the airflow, air movement in the in the <laughs> room makes a substantial difference. Exactly, and what we have observed. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. Even the hush box, what we are making, has got a laminar vent, laminar flow. Yeah. So that that that's helping in a big way. But yeah, but like I said, NC10 is very hard number. Like what you said, it's uh, yeah. It's it's hard. Uh, it's really hard. I mean, I I'm just curious one time, so I just wanted to know, like, you know, what's your take on it? Yeah, uh, we we did a room like that at Skywalker Ranch. That was the um, was the actual the what's called a Foley stage, the the Foley yeah. stage, named after Bob Foley, who came up with the idea of doing sound effects for movies where, uh, it, you know, if this was a scene in a movie where I'm putting a glass down, but that the sound of that glass wasn't picked up, there's an actual actor watching the movie on the screen and putting the glass down, I'm trying to look for a surface. On a surface, there's a microphone picking it up. That gets recorded and you go to the next thing. And those rooms, um, if it's a loud uh, sound, it's not a problem, but sometimes they're very little subtle things. And so... And the microphones that are used are very sensitive, so the background noise needs to be extremely low so that the recordings work. And uh, there's a, a an NC5 room at Skywalker Ranch, and you you walk in there and it's just eerie quiet. Oh my God, um, the yeah. main Foley stage, and and it's everything I just described. Uh, 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 heavy concrete slab floated on everything. The whole thing's floated. It's all 
crazy, crazy. Um, and then the ventilation ducts that go in and out of the, the space are enormous, uh, very slow moving air, lots of silencers. Um, it's, what, it's what you have to do. Uh, I don't. You tend to lose a, you tend to lose your sense of directionality in an in ED space like that. I think you tend uh, no, to just. It wasn't completely anechoic, so it, it it was okay, but but it's just really quiet, and uh, it's a it's a it's just a it's a beautiful and very calming thing. I will say this, uh, totally off topic but relevant. If any of you guys are here either as end users or as people working with end users, and you're in noisy rooms, uh, echoey noisy rooms, um, there is some pretty good data from the World Health Organization on the effect it has on your health. Um, mm. The world of construction is really of of uh, architecture and construction is really starting to look at wellness in the design of places. Not just a pretty building, not just a pretty room, but you know how does it affect your health? And the the World Health Organization came up with a study recently that something like 1.7 million hours of healthy life are lost every year to noise to to noise pollution, and you know. Does that affect a room that's NC30? Probably not, but but other noisy spaces are ultimately are trouble <coughs> troublesome on your health. Pardon me. <coughs> See, I've been in a noisy room all day. Um, <laughs> from a cold. Um, I have a question, uh, a simple, straight question. You have you have done a lot of Dolby Studios with Mastering Studios and all. Um, not Hi. interestingly enough, uh, I have focused uh, for uh, strategic reasons. I focused my energy in high-end residential. I've done about five uh, uh, post-production rooms in the last ten years that are film post-production rooms that ended up being Dolby certified, and a number of DCI rooms. So they're screening rooms that can play film material. Um, but just to just to be clear, I haven't in the last ten years I haven't done that many post production facilities, uh, just because they they don't pay enough for the work we like to do. <laughs> we we get involved in these things, and and it's not it's not that our hourly rates are expensive. It's just that we really want to do it right. And you and you look at what it costs to do the design and the construction right. A lot of production facilities go, man, we can't afford that. Sorry, I, you know I've got an engineering Correct. team. We've all got. So I have a I have a question, Anthony. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the point is about what have you observed in uh, studios, especially what is the in the mixing studio? Like for example, you work for Skywalker Studio, right? I guess. And what was the noise criterion observed in it? Is it NC twenty? I mean, I'm talking in the mixing studio. You know, oh, in the mixing place. studio, uh, it typically NC twenty. And there's a whole little funny side story to that. I'll, I'll, ju I'll just mention something that's really challenging. If you build a mixing studio that's very quiet, you start to mix things into the track that are very quiet that when it goes out to the movie theater or the home theater, you don't hear them any anymore. So one of the things that's at Skywalker Ranch is what they call noise perfume. There's a button you push on the console that injects noise into the room, not, not into the mix, but just creates noise in the room that's at NC30 so that you can actually monitor what it sounds like under more realistic conditions. Isn't that weird? Otherwise, <laughs> as well as you, start, wow. you start to mix, you start exactly. to put things that are too quiet and, or you start to gradually mix at too quiet of a level. And so that's, that's a little weird thing. Anyway. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, next point uh, that we want to cover is, uh, is, room, is room. Is is room modes? I mean, you know, I mean that's uh, something that all rooms have, whether they are rectangular, square, um, octagonal. I mean, all rooms have modes, and uh, the point out here is how to identify these modes, and also which are the main modes that uh, we as room designers need to focus on, and which are the ones that we could ignore. Right. Um, you got three hours. <laughs> I just looked at the clock and we're kind of on the on the tail end of this. I think we should plan on another one. Um, so I'll, I'll say a really quick summary. Um, I'm, I'm actually looking at my screen there, see if there's any quick diagrams I can pull up. Uh, hold on one second, huh? 
I, I, I always rather try to illustrate things than, um, dee -dee 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 -dee. yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just use my hands, uh, Italian style. So all, all, all environments, uh, any anytime you're going to put walls around a speaker, there's going to be standing wave resonances. Um, actually, all everything we're listening to, all the music we hear, is all the result of standing waves. I don't know if you realize that. So, let me let me give you an example. What what is what is this? What do you call this? Some people call That's it. That's a guitar. Call, I call it a standing mm -hmm. wave generator. This is a standing wave. Okay. It's a mechanical standing wave. The string is vibrating. It's vibrating based on the tension, the mass, and the distance between here and here. And you can change the standing wave by changing where you play it. Okay? So you can play many standing waves, but this is a standing wave generator, the same way as a piano is, the same way as a flute is. What we don't want is a room that's adding its own standing waves, just to be really clear. Yep. And a standing wave uh, gets generated as as the air pressure bounces back and forth between surfaces here, 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 here. Whether they're parallel or not parallel, that's a very big confusion, is people think that if a room's like this, uh, there are no standing waves. There are. They're, they're just changed depending on where you are in the room. By the way, the standing wave generator is not square, right? It's kind of an odd shape, right? Yet it makes... It makes sound. So um, we do need to worry about standing waves. Um, and the, after, after we've worried about dynamic range and noise floor, the next thing we want to do is to make sure we have a room that doesn't enhance certain uh, low frequencies or kill certain low frequencies, depending on where you're sitting. Um, I, I call them standing waves. People call them modes, uh, which is interesting. Uh, it's a modal progression in the frequencies that have problems, so they, they become called modes, but I, I like to call it um, the, the standing wave resonances. So um, they're going to they're gonna be in the room. Uh, you can't really get rid of them. They're always going to be there. You, you can try to damp them a little bit. Um, it's really hard, but what you want to do is make sure that you're in a room where you design a room in which the standing waves that are going between front and back of the room and left and right of the room and top and bottom of the room are, are not at the same frequencies. So if you were in a room that was four meter by four meter by four meter, and as the speaker's radiating sound in there, on all three of those directions, the, the standing waves would support each other and you'd be, a, you'd be listening to certain frequencies very loud. Now, if the walls are made out of all concrete, like the gentleman from Austria brought up, then they're not damped by anything. If they're made out of gypsum board on wood or metal studs, they flex a little bit, they bend around and they damp the energy a little bit. So that reduces a little bit. Uh, but all rooms are going to have standing waves. You just have to hope that they don't overlap too much, that there's not the same frequencies across the different directions. And you can calculate it more or less. I do have to warn all of you guys that the calculations, all the calculation spreadsheets you see out there assume that the room, the walls are parallel and the walls are heavy and thick, and that there's no windows and there's no discontinuities. The minute you put a door in there that flexes and moves around, it changes everything completely. So the, you know, you're gonna maybe calculate a room and you're gonna go and measure it with a microphone or you're gonna like figure out where they really are. And you're gonna find different frequencies that are standing away than what the predictions say, uh, unfortunately. You can predict the exact numbers. It's about a $5,000 mathematical analysis process. It's expensive. You can predict it. Now, um, the, fir the first harmonic of the standing wave, which is the same thing as the, as the open string of a guitar, uh, this one, can be the loudest or not always. So if you talk about U.S. construction and, and you have a room that's, let's say, uh, six meters, the first resonance is somewhere around 25 hertz. And at 25 hertz, the, the construction is not actually going to support the reflection back and forth of that without dissipating it. So at 25 hertz, there won't really be a standing wave. There'll be a standing wave at the second harmonic. 
the first harmonic is one in which uh, a half of way of a wave fits in the room and bounces back. The same way as when I when I strum this guitar, of course you can't see it, but when I pull the strings open, it bounces back and forth between the bottom and the top of the guitar, the 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 bridge and the nut. Okay, that's the first harmonic. So sometimes, depending on the construction and the size of the room, that is the loudest. Sometimes it's not. Then there's a second harmonic in which an entire wave fits in the room, uh, which in the case of a six meter room would be around 50 or 52 hertz. And that one can be very audible. And that on a guitar, you can actually simulate that by playing a harmonic, by, by just lightly holding your finger right there. But you notice how on this open guitar, this is pretty loud. This is a, an octave higher and it's a little quieter, right? And then there's a third harmonic of that, which is, can you guys even hear that? It's very attenuated. And the same thing happens. Yeah, you can hear it. Um, same thing happens in a room. If the walls are stiff and the frequency is high enough to like not bounce the whole thing, the first harmonic will be louder, the loudest, unless it's flexing the walls. The second's going to be a little quieter. The third's going to be a little quieter. In general, by the time you get to the fourth harmonic, you're not going to hear it and it won't ring and resonate very long in the room. So I, when I'm calculating rooms, I definitely look at the first three harmonics, sometimes the first four, and make sure they don't overlap too much between the length, width, and height. And also realize that in reality, the room's going to behave a little differently than the model because the walls are never perfectly plumb and straight and all this other stuff. So it's kind of annoying. And, uh... And these we're talking about just axial modes. What happens to the tangential and the oblique? Do we even consider those or we uh, don't look at those? The tangential and obliques can be calculated and they can sometimes be heard, but they don't dominate the character of the, of the music. They're uh, yeah. um, rarely, I shouldn't say don't, rarely do you have a condition where at the seating position, you have this multiple chaos <laughs> result that it's, it's all making a mess of it all everywhere. Um, and and when we and we're talking about uh, modes, uh, let's just take for a second. We've got the modes which go between the two side walls and the modes which uh, are generated between the front and the back wall. Mm -hmm. What happens between the ceiling and the floor? I mean, there are definitely modes between there's, the ceiling a, and the floor. There are standing waves, and if you and, stand up, and if you stand correct. up and you sit down, you hear them differently. That's why they're called standing. Yeah, waves. I agree. No, but kidding. but but how do you how do you treat those? How how do you treat those? I mean, well, how, I mean, between the two side walls, you you put bass traps on on at the points where the nodes are, right? But in the ceiling, you could put one. What do you do at the floor? It's, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's the same. So how do you treat those? So let's talk about how to treat them. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I have to yeah. say they're difficult to treat. Um, the, the, uh, people sell all these bass traps. The reality, and there's a really, really good paper by Dirk Noy, a European acoustician, that shows that most of them don't work very well at all. Okay. In the region that we're interested, most of them work very well at 150 hertz, which is not the standing wave region for most of them. Right there. Um, uh, and, okay, uh, Stan, can I request please mute yourself? Yeah, Anthony, please go on. Oh, no problem. Um, so I actually leaned heavily on this whole thing years ago, ended up designing a brand new generation of standing waves called the Spring Trap. We got a patent on it. We, we used to sell it. It, came, it became too expensive to, to make. We, we paused making it. It's a very complicated assembly of a suspended panel on springs with multiple uh, Helmholtz resonators inside this acoustic amplifier inside. It's a completely crazy thing. They're hard to get rid of. So if you had a problem at 55 or 60 hertz, it it is more difficult than most people think. So um, now the cool thing is if, you, if you've got problems vertically to, and, and which, which what I mean by problems is if you go like this and at your seat position, you either hear an exaggerated range of frequency um, or, or a null because there happens to be a null from the standing wave. Um, whether you put the treatment at the ceiling or the floor, it's going to affect the vertical character. Um, and in many cases, you don't, uh, standing waves are not that victorial. Um, if you put something around the corner somewhere in the room, it is going to absorb that energy that's filling in the room and causing these nulls. So they're, um, they can be treated. And just realize that the treatment's going to be some pretty big devices or tuned devices. And, and, uh -huh. 
You can either do diaphragm boxes. Um, it's funny because I have all of these things, all these drawings on, on a PowerPoint presentation here, but if I start to go in there, we'll never get done. So they, they can either just be boxes that are about this deep, but tuned to the right frequency, like a drum, um, or um, a perforated box in which the, the perforation acts as a resonator with the volume inside and is all tuned to the right frequency. You put a little bit of absorption inside so that it's not just very peaky. And you, you can tune these things to a pretty low frequency, but it takes a fair, a fair number of them to treat it. My, my, my approach on it is completely different today. I got frustrated with it. Um, 20, 20, 20 years or 25 years of trying to build these and hawk those and, and doing this and that and just going, man, it just never, does, never quite works. The way I deal with it is I put four subwoofers in the room, take the bass off all of the speakers, and then tune the subwoofers to where they're contradicting the standing waves. It's called bass optimization. A guy called Todd Welty wrote the book on this. Essentially, he wrote a really good paper back in 2003. We're, we're talking 20 years ago now um, about... What happens when you put four subwoofers in the four corners of a room or the midpoints of the room or like the way we like to do is two in the two in the back corners and two in the top front corners or the other direction so you're addressing the the you're contradicting the standing wave front to back left to right and top to bottom and then you tune them with different delays and different eq and different phase until at the seating position the sound is smooth and sometimes you get gain uh, sometimes at the seat position, by doing that tuning, you find yourself with six, seven, eight, nine dB more energy than mm. before you tuned them. So that's that's my brute force approach these days. Now we, when oh. we des when, uh, I'll just finish this. When we design rooms, we do include some base absorption. We do include volumes, either the, the platform riser for the back row or something somewhere that's soaking up low frequency so that the reverberation time is controlled. But we always plan on some, some amount of low frequency control to get rid of those, those problems. Um, I'll, I'll more, I have done some webinars on this and I'll more than gladly come back and, and do a little compendium of slides on this particular effect. Um, so I think, uh, that, Anthony, that, that would be uh, Masman, I'll take over now. Uh, Anthony, if there is cool. any closing comment that uh, you want to make, I think uh, we are we have stretched you long enough. It's right now 11.15 at uh, your end. So I will not uh, bother you any further. I think we okay. had a fantastic first session today. And uh, uh, folks, uh, Anthony is going to come back uh, in the future also. So. Uh, it's not that this is the first and last session. Anthony, I hope what I said is true. <laughs> yeah. It is, absolutely. It is, absolutely. Yeah. Let me, let me actually, before, before, um, before I go and, and finish my day that started very early today in California, I do want to show you this as a, as a preview of what, what you can... Um, some people, when I talk about these multiple subwoofers, go, what's... I, what is he talking about? That's ridiculous. I, it's, you don't put subwoofers behind you. Yeah, yeah, you do. The low frequency is going to fill in the room from all directions. You, you know, you want to pressurize the center. But I, I want to actually share some data points, some actual kind of proof of this stuff of, of some rooms we've done. So this is one room I've worked in that has really bad standing waves. This is a room in which uh, at low frequency, there's no standing waves because the walls are not supporting it. And then at, at 38 hertz, there's a peak, and then there's a really nasty dip at 52 hertz, and it goes up and down. And the difference in frequency response because of standing waves, with one, one, one speaker in the front or one subwoofer in the front, is 38 decibels of error, really bad. Hmm. Um, if you take that same room and you put... Um, Let's see, I'm gonna go here. For, first off, if you put four subwoofers, oh, I, I bypassed something. If you put four subwoofers in this room and you tune them with, with uh, bass optimization, you can get at four, this is four different microphone locations. The other one was a single one, but you can get to a frequency response that's the, you see this green, ignore the red and blue curve, but you can get to a frequency response that looks that smooth, same room. One subwoofer versus four subwoofers. And so this, mm. is, this is really smooth frequency response. Um, here's another room, totally different one. 
um, in which four subwoofers are placed in the room. Um, this curve, actually, let me go to one that's particularly obvious. Hold on one second. This is this is this was the most stunning one. So this in in green is a room of four subwoofers in the four corners before base optimization, where we had, where we adjust different delays in EQ at the four subwoofers, and the bass is pretty smooth. You know, it's not bad, it's not very loud. And then with in this case eight milliseconds of delay, probably on one of the back speakers, this is the gain we got out of the bass in that room. Now that's not flat anymore, right? That's not flat response, but all of this is free energy. Then you equalize that down, right? This is the, this is the acoustic capacity of the speaker of the subwoofers has gone up by 12 decibels. We haven't changed anything in the room, haven't changed anything, but the way the, the subwoofers are driving the standing waves in the room. And we got, we got 12 dB more energy out of the subwoofer, which you then flatten back out with equalization to smooth it all out. Um, unbelievable. So then this room goes from decent bass to really loud bass. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll talk all about that in a future session if you, if you guys want to. The reason I spend this much time on bass is um, it is the foundation essentially of music. Um, if you listen to really well written music, the bass line really is what drives it. Just kind of has a nice, uh, a nice rhythm to it. And the bass needs to be nice and even and continuous and it has to be timed correctly. And if you have a room with really bad standing waves, it screws up the, the timing of the bass. It won't sound good. Of course, for movies, if you have big holes in the bass, a big explosive event doesn't come through. It's just a little thud and it's just, it's uh, lacking in, in ex uh, excitement. So um, we're, we are over time. I will take some questions if you guys want to. And we'll, I'll take can do more. one question from the audience. Just one question. So uh, please raise your hand in the chat window. Whoever wants to ask a question. Uh, one question only. And this is a strict uh, one question only policy. So whoever wants to ask, ask a question, please uh, go ahead. Uh, they can raise I their... Think uh, I want to ask a question. Uh, who's this? So I see Speak, Arthi Kushru. Ah, Kushru. Yeah, Kushru. Please go ahead, Kushru. Hi, uh, I just have a, a question uh, that relates to modern loudspeakers uh, evolving over over the old classical design of loudspeakers. We have, I mean, I, I'm from the home audio, but of course have a lot of interest in the pro audio. Uh, in difficult rooms in with, with architects and interior designers making it more and more difficult for us in a country like India, would cardioid... Not, I'm sorry, let me interrupt you. Not just India. Okay. <laughs> this is a worldwide <laughs> phenomenon. Yeah. All right. Okay. I accept it, but I, I can only take the burden of my country. You know? okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, would cardioid loudspeakers and, uh, you know, with, with very focused waveguide, high frequency uh, devices and mid-band uh, areas having cardioid dispersion, along with uh, uh, even maybe, maybe cardioid subwoofers, I'm not too sure. But dipole subwoofers in certain in a, in a certain manner be a very modern, effective way of dealing with a lot of reflective energy in the mid mid and high frequency. You know, like 150 hertz or maybe even 100 hertz upwards. Um, that's a. Uh, I would love to spend an hour talking about just that. So, I came from a background. Uh, of the original co collective unconscious, that's like, well, if a room's very live, you just focus the energy, and did many, many rooms like that, and the, uh, it doesn't always work out. You're like, well, I mean, yeah. it's intelligible, okay. but it's not, it's not really pleasing. I can, I get intelligibility, but I don't know. And then you start to study it, and you study it, and you read the book by Dr. Floyd Toole, explains this, so. If you want to do what you're thinking of doing, you have to do it really from about, you don't have to go as low as 150 hertz, but really from 250 or 300 hertz on up, you need to have constant directivity that's focused some amount. So let's, uh, let's, let's talk about a, a, no, a normal speaker is generally hemispherical, not even cardioid. It's not even that far. It's, it's hemispherical above a certain frequency, uh, which is a directivity index of six, as in half of the six. energy is going forward. 
Um, and uh, but most speakers start that way and then they start to focus and then they open up and focus and then open up. So what's actually going in the room is not always the same as what's going to you. If you want to build a constant directivity speaker that instead of being hemispherical is less than that, let's say has a directivity index of 10, 10. which means there's 10, 30 degrees. The, the ratio of what's going directly to you versus the overall sound power is 10 dB as opposed to six, it's 10. So it's a little more focused. You want to make sure that it's doing that from 200 hertz on up so that what the room is getting is the same at all frequencies. And there's a mistake that a lot of people do. They make, they make speakers with focus, but it, the focus only starts at one and a half or two kilohertz, which is a, a horn, you know, a, a, about this big by that big. Practical. You know, it's something that's practical. There have been speakers with enormous horns in big movie theater or big sound reinforcement systems. But how do you put that in a home? You don't. So a, a lot of people say, well, we'll take, we'll make a speaker with, you know, with a horn and a waveguide or whatever about this big, and we'll focus the energy. And then, and there is an expectation. It's like, this is going to sound great. And it doesn't. And you're like, why, why does this sound so honky and mid rangey and oh my goodness. And then you start to play with the EQ and you try to take out some three kilohertz and some two kilohertz and you mess with this. And suddenly the dialogue's not clear and you start to go around in this, uh, like a dog chasing its tail, like I can't get there from here. So what's up? So we read the book by Floyd Dooley and he explains that ultimately what's going in your ear is the sum of what's coming directly plus all the reflections in the room. So if you make a speaker that's got some directivity, but only over half the range, let's say from one kilohertz on up, everything below five, a kilohertz is now wide. I'm I'm just kind of taking a very crude slice right there, right? So a, a horn that's about this big by that big is going to control above one kilohertz. So below below one kilohertz, the room so is just basically living room room is good. because you get multiple openings, no? Sound yeah, decay ho jata hai. Ha, to sound jaldi decay ho jata hai. But closed room mein whereas guys, decay hota hai nahi. Sound bounce back, bounce back, both hota hai. Guys, talk English. 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 He would not understand. Back come karne ke liye sound treatment, sound proofing karna padta hai. You are the control. I'm just going to take it back. So if I can finish. So below one below one kilohertz, you haven't gained anything in terms of that sound reflection it, uh, or that sound that pattern control. It's still just bouncing around. Above one kilohertz, it's more directional. But your ear doesn't know what you're trying to do. It's just hearing all of this reflected energy below one kilohertz and suddenly it, there's a quick transition to where it's focused and that sounds honky for one and for two doesn't doesn't sound smooth the intelligibility is not there because everything below one kilohertz is 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 ugly so so now what well you put put speakers with bigger horns or you do try to do something else there are all kinds of approaches really the the way i like to do it i'll just mention very quickly after lots and lots and lots of trial and error I like to work with the architect to try to treat the wall somehow. And there's ways to do it that doesn't look like, like an audio laboratory. There's, I got tons and tons of pictures of things we've done, um, including this amazing material called Boswophone, which is a plastered material, comes from Switzerland. There's four different competitors now that you, uh, you trowel over absorptive surfaces. And it's um, look, looking like just like painted sheetrock or painted plaster, but, you be behind the troweled material, which is porous to sound, there's actual sound absorption. Um, so you can use some of that. Uh, but I like to combine that with speakers that have broad dispersion because you either want to control it over the entire region of frequencies or you just got to let it fly all the way up and down and really evenly. And it's really counterintuitive, but in a really live room, you're better off lighting up the entire sound power evenly, not one that changes with frequency, but just light it up really evenly and then tune the overall tonal balance with EQ and the ear is happier with that than speakers that change directivity with frequency. Um, and Floyd, Dr. Floyd Toll has been claiming that for years. I found some references even earlier than that, go back to the 50s. I've tried all these approaches and in general, I am... I find the sound of a co 
constant wide dispersion speaker in a room with equalization to be more pleasant in the end if you assume the architect didn't let you do any treatment at all? It's uh, very so, counterintuitive. So I, I agree with what you say. My point was like, you know, uh, there are certain st uh, companies in, in, in Finland, especially in Finland now, you know, uh, which have a, a cardioid lights, loudspeaker right down to 150 cycles and their directivity index is constant. You know, I mean, I mean, they've engineered yeah. it that way. Yeah. How would that work in, in a live room where, where, where the directive index doesn't change across frequency if you go up? Then uh, your high frequency becomes narrow, and then suddenly the HF unit comes, and again it it lights up the room. Where Floyd or Tool is absolutely right, I agree with him. But if the general directivity index is constant from, if you say two hundred, I, I, because I know speakers that do up to one fifty cycles. Yeah, it's fine. Would, yeah. Oh, we lost you. You you got muted. Okay, come back. There you are. Yeah. Would that be good? Uh, I mean, a general directivity index above 150 kilohertz being very constant. Would that be good in a live room? Con constant directivity. That's the key. Uh, yeah. If you can achieve that um, and understanding that cardioid is actually essentially wider than most speakers do. You know, mo yeah. most two-way speakers, six and a half inch two-way or eight inch two-way, you know, seven, seven, between a, a woofer that's between 17 and 20 centimeters, at, in the mid-range, it's starting to beam. It's not cardio yeah. anymore. It's actually quite narrow. And then it crosses over to the tweeter. That's why dispersion in above 2 or 3 kilohertz, it starts to, uh, about 5 or 6 kilohertz for, for a 25 millimeter tweeter starts to beam again. That is not constant directivity. That's very... No, I mean, if, it's, if the tweeter is waveguide loaded, you know, I mean, yep. it's waveguide loaded. Yep, so, absolutely. I mean, so like, for example, Dutch and Dutch, I don't know, you know, I mean, I don't distribute that loudspeaker. It's a very interesting loudspeaker, which is which has got a kind of a cardioid pattern. Uh, I think Kai 3 also does something similar, guys. Correct me if I'm wrong. They can do uh, that, right? A cardioid. Not, not really. It's slightly different. Yeah, okay. The main, but, the main, but the main The main thing is constant directivity. So the directivity. sound power, what you're lighting the room up with is is as close as possible to the direct sound because that is the least objectionable to our ear. To our ears. And once you do that, the brain has an easier time separating the direct sound from the reflected sound. Reflected and sound. all of those echoes, all of those things that it just showed, they tend, your brain can deal with it easier and you, you can just cut right through it. There will, the room is still gonna morph the perceived tonal balance of the speaker and you gotta go at it with equalization. Sometimes it's subjective. Um, you, that that particular room I showed you, I ended up having to measure and listen and measure and listen and measure and listen until I got to a point where its tonal balance was right, essentially working against the um, the reverb curve of the room. You're sort of contradicting that that bell curve, just going in the other direction. Uh, if I could, sh if I had more time, I would show you the final frequency response. It looked it looked like something that if you walked in and you measured, you go, "That's horrible," and then you'd listen and go, "Well, that's not horrible. What's wrong?" Well, the sound power of the speaker didn't match the depth of the room. All the you know, start with a speaker with constant directivity, um, which means that it's going to either be really, really big, or if it's if it's smaller, it's going to be a wider directivity, which is okay. Make sure you have equalization available to you so you can tune, or what what I'm going to call voice it. You know, adjust the overall tonal balance to where it sounds good, and you'd be amazed. Um, this is from a guy who makes and sells acoustical materials. I'm going to tell you, you'd be amazed what you can do if you have a constant directivity speaker and an equalizer to make good sound with no acoustical treatments. And then if you can put acoustical treatments on top of that, oh my God, it's even better. But you can, you can get quite far along. I see on the cake. Yeah. Uh, so I think so, basically... Okay. Tony is telling us, uh, he's, he's telling us all of us need to get Western electric horns now, you know, those big guys, you know, <laughs> and put Good them into our living rooms. Good luck with that. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. will, I will do a shameless plug. So with this knowledge in mind, I started a speaker company about five years ago that goes in that direction of building constant directivity speakers that are active, that are online, that have all kinds of other features that I was just not seeing in the residential space. 
just kind of bringing in some practices from commercial and pro audio and bringing those into the residential space. So there's no crossovers built in. Everything is in, in the digital amplifier. The amplifiers are Dante enabled if you want to do that. So all the things that we should be thinking to be progressive, we're doing mm -hmm. that at speakers. We have our own wave guides that, that have this really constant pattern control. And um, I don't want to make this an advertising campaign, but that that speaker design came from trial and error and trial and error and trial and error of lots of things. They've done a thousand projects in the field. And it's like, man, this is, this is the way a speaker should be made so that we have less problems with the room, less problems with architects, um, and, and can play really loud and can play really sweet orchestral music if you want it. That's, that's a good speaker overall that can count, uh, cover all of that range. So. All right, um, I'm going to sign off. It's getting yeah, late here. Uh, yeah, with uh, uh, I must say that it's been a great session. Thank you, Anthony, and uh, sorry for sorry for keeping you waiting for this long. It's uh, it's close to uh, eleven thirty p.m. for Anthony. So with uh, with respect to his timings, I I must say we'll sign off right now. So we this session is going to continue. As in Anthony is going to come back for more sessions in the future. Yep. So we'll keep you posted on that front and. Uh, Thanks everyone for participating. It's been a great session. We'll have uh, some questions taken offline. I'll I'll connect with Anthony in person and I'll review your questions and we'll uh, we'll answer them uh, in due course. Thank okay. you everyone. I'm going to sign up right now. Good All night right. everyone. And good night guys, Anthony and good day right, to everyone. If you guys need to get a hold of me, uh, Karthik, are you are you sharing my contact info or websites with the team? I will, I will. So I will. Okay, uh, when the when the uh, when the YouTube video goes online, uh, your your contact details will be shared. So uh, we will very good uh, in that. Very good. Thanks, guys. Thank, um, thank you, I'm everybody. Sorry. Have a good Saturday. Good, good day. Good Thanks, day. Anthony, and good night. Bye, bye.